Yes. So, uh, welcome to this uh, um, very important seminar. My name is Martin Wolf. Um, I'm Chief Economics Commentator for the Financial Times. In sitting in here in this magnificent atrium, which is what a new building built for the fund while I was working at the World Bank, I was always told that, and I don't know whether it's true, that it was actually paid for by the interest earned from the United Kingdom from the 1976 bailout, um, in which case you might soon be getting a lot more money. <laughs> um, I'm allowed to say that. So the, um, the, uh, we're going to talk about one of the most important topics now confronting the world, certainly in terms of the numbers of human beings who will be affected, namely debt restructuring, why too little and too late, we have a wonderful panel. I'll just go through them very quickly. On my far left is Gita Gopinath, Gopinath, who's first deputy managing director of the fund now. And next to her is Anna Gelpen, professor at Georgetown Law and senior non-resident fellow at the Peter Peterson Institute of International Economics. And next to her is Lee Buhait, honorary professor at the University of Edinburgh, a legend in this area. Next to him is Elena Duga, Daga, who's chair of Moody Macroeconomics, Moody's Macroeconomic Board and managing director of credit, credit strategy and research. Last but not least to my left is Axel Weber, former president of the Bundesbank and of UBS, a former chairman of UBS and now chairman of the Institute for International Finance. And the issues we're going to address in order are how severe are the debt problems we now confront? Um, what are the risks of a serious systemic crisis? And what would that mean for the countries um, that will be affected and for the world? And finally, and most significantly, what reforms are needed to handle debt problems better than we are now able to do? And uh, I'm going to start then with the state of play, where we are today, um, with Gita. Thank you, Martin. Hey, okay. Is there a security? Yeah, we got the point. We got the point. We got the point. Thank you very much. Was this part of the party? Now, this is very, a very interesting experience. I was about to remark as I got in, started, that I found it actually almost impossible to get into this building just now. <laughs> I, it took me 25 minutes to get through security. I'm fascinated by the story behind this. I must find out about it. Anyway. Can you get, speak over okay, this? Okay, yeah, I, I, I will try to. I mean, it's clearly a very important issue, and it's, as you can see, it's getting a lot of attention, as it should. I think it's, if you want to put the facts out, uh, if you look at low-income countries, we have about 60% of low-income countries that are either already in debt distress or in high risk of debt distress. And if you look at emerging markets, that number is about 25%. Now, to be clear, it's not as if we have a systemic sovereign debt crisis. There are the vast majority of emerging market economies are nowhere near there. But on the other side, we do have many countries 
uh, several of whom, for instance, are in Sub-Saharan Africa, where this is a major challenge. And we just put out our update to the World Economic Outlook. What we saw is a further downgrade. We have the global economy projected to grow at 2.7% next year. And this is at a time, and is also a consequence of the fact that because of very high inflation and monetary tightening, interest rates are going up, uh, cost of borrowing is going up around the world at a time when uh, you know, after two years of the pandemic and now after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the energy costs that have gone up, their fiscal space to deal with all of this is very little. So it's a big issue that we have to deal with and I suspect we will grapple for several months to come in the, in the future. So um, thank you very much. This sounds very significant above all for low-income countries. Uh, and um, so, Elena, um, how do you see it? We do expect to see uh, sovereign default rates picking up over the next couple of years. So we do not expect, very similarly, we do not expect a widespread emerging markets debt crisis. But given the negative turn in credit conditions, we do expect the number of defaults to pick up. And I can give you an example. We already have six sovereign defaults this year in 2022, and that's relative to typically one to two defaults on average in a typical year. And this year we are already at the spike that we saw back in 2020 in the middle of the coronavirus shock. Credit conditions have turned more negative. We are looking at uh, elevated inflation rising and in high interest rates and slowing growth. Emerging markets are looking at less supportive external environment in terms of tighter financial conditions and slower trade growth. And we're looking at high uncertainty and high risks in the economic environment and the possibilities of much deeper economic contractions, which normally translates into financial markets volatility and episodes of stop and go market access. So this will all mean an elevated default rates over the next couple of years. We are most, maybe I'll leave you on that, but one last point, we are, uh, countries are not equally vulnerable. There's a lot of diversity across resilience and ability to adapt to, to the sequence of shocks. Uh, but we see, and some of the large emerging markets are less vulnerable to this environment. But we see the frontier markets, uh, frontier, frontier markets which are highly reliant on external financing, which have a larger share of foreign currency debt as being most vulnerable. So Axel, um, looking at it from the point of view of the private sector, particularly involved with this from the point of view of, the, of a major bank, how do you see the world in front of you in terms of debt distress and associated problems of debt management and restructuring? Well, so first of all, debt is not just a problem in emerging markets. It's a debt in all mature markets, including the very country in which we are gathering here, GDP, debt to GDP ratio in the United States is touching 100%. So debt is a factor that is prevalent in all countries. What makes debt in emerging markets particularly bad is they face pretty adverse conditions. Uh, the first one, uh, and let me just mention a few factors, the first one is growth is slowing, in particular in emerging markets, with all the consequences this has for government revenues and therefore for the ability to service debt. Second, if you look at emerging markets, debt service cost as a percentage of revenue has gone up from 6% to 10% over the last decade, whilst in developed countries it has gone down from 6% to 4%. So emerging markets are impacted a lot more in terms of their ability to pay debt than more of the, uh, many of the mature markets. Inflation. I mean, we know there are five ways to deal with excessive debt. Debt restructuring is one of the most severe forms of it. Growing out of it is the best way. Inflating it away is unfortunately a way we can't completely exclude at the current juncture where most of the deficits has been, uh, you know, worldwide have been eliminated, uh, have been uh, accompanied by a massive increase in central bank balance sheets. And 
you know, like in reality, you often get a factor combination of all of the aforementioned. We are at a very critical juncture. And on top of that, we are at a very difficult moment in the business cycle. Uh, we have a change of interest rates uh, at a pace that is unprecedented. I think it's just a reflection of the fact that central banks are late in their tightening cycle and have overdone it again in their easing cycle, like so many times before. And the very steep number of consequential and subsequent changes in interest rate is just a reflection of how late they are to get inflation on, under control. And that is hitting emerging markets and not just the mature world. Food insecurity. We have a war uh, in Ukraine uh, with all of its consequences for food security and for the prices of uh, primary, um, you know, of, of, uh, of, of energy and uh, particularly, but also for food. So emerging markets have a couple of headwinds come their way. And last not least, most of them are very dependent on funding abroad. 90% of emerging market debt uh, is in US dollars and the dollar is appreciating. And uh, the lowest income countries have had pretty strong reliance on their domestic banking systems in issuing debt. So the banking systems have very little buffers to absorb additional debt. And that is, makes the whole mix of constellations at the moment much worse for emerging market than they are for the mature countries. So that sounds... Uh pretty alarming in terms of the prospects, having just read through the world economic outlook and particularly their, their downside scenario. It looks pretty completely plausible that it can only get uh, much worse. Anna, how, how, how do you see it? So thank you, Martin. And uh, because I'm not an economist and not a historian, let me uh, venture into some economic history. Um, First, I think it's important, echoing what uh, both, uh, I think, Gita started out with, that countries insist on paying. They insist on paying through pandemics, through famines, through wars. Um, when the payment systems are closed to them, they try to finagle their way into paying. And this has been something that's been, uh, that we've seen in the last couple of years. Second, um, creditors are also debtors, and that affects the behavior of both in a crisis. And third, responding to our colleagues who've just left, um, debt relief is vital, but debt relief is not a substitute for resources. We could get rid of all debt right now if we said no more debt. Debt is not oxygen, it's a social convention, right? But the question really is how are we going to finance the in incredible needs of vulnerable countries and really the rest of the world. So against this background, it's not surprising that it took the Paris Club more than 30 years to get to net present value relief and still more to get to nominal relief. It's not surprising that it took the private sector and bank regulators nearly a decade to come up with financial engineering to get out of the 1980s debt crisis. And it's not surprising that uh, you know, the problems of Japanese banks at home um, had a tremendous influence on uh, the position of those banks abroad and uh, leading into the Asian financial crisis, right? Um, all of this um, does not make me terribly optimistic, but again, I'm not an economist, not a historian, so just saying. I like, I particularly liked, I mean, you made some very important points. This countries insist on paying, and creditors not infrequently, historically, have insisted they should at least pretend to do so. And one of the most obvious stories that I remember incredibly well was the Latin American debt crisis, in which the consequences of pretending it was all going to be paid was that the economies and vast numbers of people within them were devastated. And it seems to me a terrible outcome. Um, and that brings me to you, Lee. Does this mean, for the very reasons that Arno suggested, um, that it's always too little, too late, and therefore there are, what we should be really focusing on and thinking about is the social and economic costs of not dealing proactively with debt? I think the too late part of that equation can be laid mostly at the feet of the local politicians. Uh, sovereign debt restructurings are inherently disagreeable experiences. 
and the IMF's economic prescriptions almost always politically unpalatable. Every right, rightly constructed local politician will therefore want to delay commencing a debt restructuring as long as possible, hopefully until the next administration takes office. And that explains, I think, why you have seen this pathological procrastination uh, again and again, going all the way back, Martin, to August of 1982 with Mexico. Uh, but we've seen it most recently, uh, Venezuela in 2017, uh, Sri Lanka this year. Uh, so the too little, uh, that sin, I think, can be shared between the debtors and the creditors. The creditors look at these uh, exercises and say, well, uh, it could result in too much debt relief and overshooting or too little uh, debt relief. Uh, and if you're a creditor, you would rather run the risk of too little. Why? Because uh, you get a, a deal done, uh, there's three or four or five years of principal grace and uh, significant coupon adjustments. And at the end of that time, if the country has to do it again, they do it again. Uh, from the standpoint of the debtor country, uh, the politicians also want that crisis to be over quickly. And therefore, they are emotionally predisposed to uh, say, Give me four or five years of significant debt relief. And as Doris Day used to say, que sera, sera. So let's turn to the question. We've talked about this environment. Let's suppose we're in a situation in which a very large number of countries, we discussed, but you've already, Gita already suggested that it was a very large number of countries, particularly low-income countries, were in very serious difficulties at the same time, um, perhaps because of a broader systemic crisis, perhaps a financial crisis, anything of this kind can happen. Um, are we in a position to handle an event of that kind effectively, particularly given the desire of the, the countries to procrastinate, um, and how significant could that then be if we can't handle it for the countries affected and even globally? What's your view on that, Gita? So uh, let me tell you how I see it, how we see it, given the experience we've had with debt restructuring mechanism, and we have the common framework in place that's been there for uh, almost two years now, and we've had some cases. So I think it's useful to lay out how this, where the too little, too late comes in. So there is the part about how long does it take to actually come up with a restructured debt once the country agrees to go ahead and do it, right? So there's that part. Uh, and then there's the part that precedes it, which is what Lee and Anna mentioned, which is the, I would describe, called the gambling for redemption, which is the fact that you just want to wait as long as you can. And both of those are very important steps of the solution that we have problems with. And since this panel is supposed to be about focusing on private creditors, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, the issues through that lens. So on the whole, gambling for redemption, you're absolutely right. It's politically very costly because countries uh, governments who have extremely short horizons and you know, mostly worried about staying in power, they want this not to be there on their plate. They don't want to have to deal with a messy default or messy restructuring while it's on their plate. They would rather kick the can down the road. But then on the other hand, the creditors too uh, are also comfortable with having some very optimistic projections about what the future might bring and therefore kick the can down the road and not acknowledge the actual constraints that are on the country to actually repay. So I, th I think this is not just the debtor country's issue, but also creditors in acknowledging the depth of the problem. Another reason that uh, countries don't want to come too soon is because, of course, they're worried about losing market access. Uh, and one of the issues that they deal with is, you know, they're, they're always concerned about what credit rating agencies will do. And since Elena is here, maybe she could speak to that. 
Um, so for instance, when we had the debt suspension, so DSSI, the debt service suspension initiated, uh, you know, it was, it was a, what we would call a preemptive neutral, and neutral to NPV initiative. Um, Moody's treated that as perfectly fine, that was okay, but there were other rating agencies that if a country went and actually approached official creditors for any kind of relief, that it got them into trouble. So we need to solve this. What I'm trying to say is that it's not just the country that's holding back, but they have legitimate concerns about market access, and uh, we need solutions from everybody. And then there comes the piece, which is how to actually restructure, which of course requires deciding what is the restructuring envelope, what capacity does the country have to repay, and there's a lot of disagreement on that front. At the IMF, if I may um, you know, put out there, is that we're coming up with a new sovereign risk and debt sustainability framework that I think will hopefully give more confidence to creditors and debtors about the you know, about clarity, about the way we see things going forward, the amount of restructuring that will be needed so that we can have much faster agreement to move forward, because otherwise one is stuck in that stage for a very long time. All very difficult, and I got the sense from what Keith uh, was saying that, um, of course, not Moody's, but the part of the problem is the ratings agency's response to these restructurings. What is your perspective on that, Elena? So let me, let me maybe start explaining what, what happens to ratings through debt restructuring. The <laughs> countries are normally, debt restructuring are very severe events. So crisis, and I'll, I'll start there. So sovereign debt crisis are typically very severe events. You have fiscal stress, you have economic stress, 90% of, of, of defaults are accompanied by economic recessions. 60% of defaults are accompanied by currency crisis or systemic banking crisis. So these are very, very severe events. And by the time we get to a debt restructuring, the uh, credit worthiness is, is very, very stressed. So the way ratings work is the, again, ratings, maybe just for background, ratings refer to debt repayment capacity. Ratings normally come lower on the rating scale way before any talk of restructuring has started as, as credit worthiness deteriorates over time. Ratings are low on the wages scale indicating high risk of default and high risk of losses a long time before that. They remain low leading up to a debt restructuring and through a debt restructuring indicating the high risk of default and the high risk of losses to investors. Upon the completion of a debt exchange, Ratings are reassessed, and the reassessed rating, and normally in a debt exchange, you have the old bonds are withdrawn, new bonds come into the market, they're re-rated, and they're newly rated, looking at debt repayment capacity, looking forward towards the medium term. And that reassessment of the rating takes into account any benefits that come on the back of, of the debt restructuring. So any benefits in terms of debt relief, in terms of lowering debt servicing costs, and it also takes into account the forward-looking expectations about the trajectory of the, economics, of the economy, the trajectory of policy, fiscal policy, the, the, the debt trajectory. Axel, can I ask you to focus a bit on another dimension uh, in this broader context, which is not just the private lending to governments, but the private lending to private borrowers in a systemic crisis for a country, and certainly a more global one, these interact. They always interact. And the government often has to bail out parts of the private sector, has to bail out banks, so uh, it, it becomes very multifaceted. And obviously, there's far more complicated structures of private debt on both sides of the, on all these balance sheets now than they used to be in the past. How difficult is that going to make handling a situation of the kind indeed you described? Well, I think there are multiple channels, as you said, where debt will become interacted. Uh, and one, one thing you can see is uh, private sector debt in emerging markets is now 150% of GDP. It's almost up by 100% for non-financial corporate sector. It's about a third up for the private households. 
and if you look at some numbers of the IAF, almost 55% of the corporate sector debt is in state-owned enterprises. So if there is a problem of the corporate sector and corporate sector debt, it could easily sort of become a problem of the public sector because it feeds back to the, to the public balance sheet. Now, uh, I think we stand at a point where over the last years, with interest rates in mature markets negative or close to zero, pulling down the entire interest rate curve, even in emerging markets, debt was seen as an easy way out. It was seen going into debt was a reasonable choice because everyone had the illusion that rates would stay low for long and therefore financing things through, uh, through debt markets has become uh, a way to go. Uh, you can't blame emerging markets that they copy what they see in the mature world. Uh, now the problem is emerging markets have much less ability to pay back this debt and it could become a very interactive mix between the public and the private players. But let me, because you mentioned the, the, uh, the private sector, uh, around 40% of debt in low and lower income countries uh, or financing comes from the multilateral organizations, another 40% from from official sectors, institutions in the mature markets. And only 20% in those countries is financed by the private sector. The perception of the people on the podium here has probably been, this has all been the banks, and uh, it's not. The banks are part of the picture, but they're the smaller part of the picture. And if you come to a point where you need to restructure debt, if you then give senior creditor status to everyone, starting from the IMF to the entire official sector all the way down, you end up with 20% of the debt being able to restructure at the expense of outside government entities, and that has been, in my view, where the too little too late comes from. The private sector will not be the first that moves. The private sector will come in when countries ask for a debt restructuring, and the private sector will only move if the public sector and the multilateral organization all find a common framework for moving together. We don't have that common framework yet. Uh, I'm one of the three trustees for the principle of sovereign debt restructuring. We just revised the principles. There's a lot of work having been done in the 90s and 2000s to develop a method, but we're not there even after 30 years of trying. So I think nowadays the money doesn't come from banks. You need a much broader stakeholder engagement here when it comes to debt restructuring than just the official sector and the private sector. You need every stakeholder around the table, including the countries that would have to ask for it, and the private sector in those countries who might face debt problems but don't want to ask for restructuring. So I think we're becoming, you know, this is, we have to think much broader than we have. The IMF and the World Bank are no longer the only ones that are stakeholder here, uh, in addition to the public sector. We need to look at the COP process, for example, as a process where all the stakeholders are involved around environmental discussions. Why isn't debt in emerging markets such a broad discussion with all stakeholders around the table? This cannot be solved by the private and public sector alone. There are many more stakeholders. So, Anna, um do you want to add anything on the question of how we could handle systemic events? Um, sure, thank you. So, and I think I'm going to echo a lot of what Axel just said, but may or, we may or may not come out with the same prescriptions despite a similar uh, diagnosis. So, look, part of the concern right now is that there's no agreement on who is public and who is private, right? And you know, the state-owned enterprises and these sovereign wealth funds and these state-owned but commercial institutions um, are uh, a question mark in the uh, institutional context that comes from a very different world. In that world, the G7 dominate all the institutions and frankly, it doesn't really matter how they coordinate in debt restructuring because the next day they're going to see each other and coordinate in a different setting, right? So there's a much deeper investment in coordination in the old world, and it didn't really matter whether KFW was public or private. You could restructure it in the Paris Club or somewhere else, right? Well, today we lack that broader institutional framework for coordination, and that creates enormous incentives to arbitrage, right? Because if you get any kind of an advantage from being called public or private, um, you're going to try to pursue it. 
right? So the question is, how do we get much more robust policy instruments as well as contractual instruments to try to eliminate that distinction, whatever you're called, to get away from the incentive to you know, call yourself one thing or another? So I'm doing incredibly badly on time management because I'm such a nice person. Um, Lee, please keep your remark brief because we're, we're, because I want to get to the last section when you can perhaps have a little bit more. All right, I'll make a prediction. If we had, in 2023, 12 or 15 countries going through a sovereign debt restructuring, I think you would see uh, the evolution of a template of a transaction, as there was in the Brady era. Uh, it may come from the official sector. I would expect that, as it did in the Brady era. It may come from the private sector. But I think you would see the inter-debtor rivalry uh, such that countries would say, I don't want to get a worse deal than Ruritania. And therefore, that would, it would evolve to a template of a structure. And maybe it should. It actually leads very well to the last section. Basically, what you're saying, which I think is probably true, alas, is the only way significant international reform ever happens if the system demonstrably is breaking down and there's no alternative but to do something about it. I'm not quite as optimistic about, as that about where we are now um, given the state of world leadership, but it does sound very plausible. But this leads then, I think, to the, the last section, which is, and I'd like, since we have very limited time, I'd like to do it this way. I'd like to ask each of you to put down what you think is the single most important reform of the system, which is sort of semi-plausible. We're not going to get a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, alas. Um, that, that we need to have worked out and ideally put in place to handle the coming debt storm. Um, and I'm going to ask, actually I'm going to start and it's one point, but central, crucial from your point of view. May I start with you, Axel? Well, investor relations. You need to have transparency. You need to know who your debtors are. And they're now such a complex structure that every country that has debt should have an investor relations that is outstanding so they know all the counterparties that they need to involve and have continuous relationship with them, be very transparent about where they stand and how this is playing out. And that has not been the case in the past. I think it's much more complex. So investor relations matter uh, for everyone that is in the debt market. So right now what you're saying is, just to be quite clear, that most countries don't know in any detail who their creditors are. And the creditors don't know who the other creditors are. So transparency is really necessary at all fronts. That's what, why we started at the OECD, a transparency register uh, for uh, least developed countries. That's important so you know what is in the contracts, whether assets of, of the countries are pledged. It's broad-based transparency. We lack that, and without transparency, there's no fair concept of restructuring. And that would obviously include all creditors all sovereigns, and we know what that means, as well as all private creditors. Absolutely. So, if I may turn to you, Elena, um, what is your single most important thing that needs to be done to be able to, which is not there now, to be able to handle a really major debt storm if that happens? I, you know, transparency, I think, is, is a big one, obviously, uh, and I'll leave it with a little bit different thought here, but look, Debt restructurings have both costs and they have benefits. And I think both need to be understood. The costs and the benefits might work a little bit differently if you're looking at a systemic crisis versus a single case. But I think ultimately the question is not are there costs for going through debt restructuring. Ultimately the question is do the benefits outweigh the costs? And I suppose the point will be even in a global crisis, the situation of countries would differ sufficiently that the costs and the, the, the cost-benefit ratio or balance would differ. So the, there can't be, and this is a bit different from what happened in the end with Latin America, it's, 
going to be very difficult to avoid differentiation, even in a very large crisis. That makes it very complicated, obviously, because it's, it's going to be general in one sense, but country-specific in another. That must be true. Um, and there were examples of that in previous uh, um, crises. Korea, I remember, was also in problems in 82, but it, of course, it's hand, how it evolved was very different. Um, in that case, may I move to you, Lee? Under the current system, a sovereign debtor is perfectly free to borrow as much money as it can and to spend it the way it wants. Um, if it is overextended, it goes through this very uh, painful purging process of a debt restructuring, but when it finishes it, it is back to being able to borrow as much money as it wants again. It is a kind of financial bulimia, and we've seen it again and again. The single most important thing would be to find some mechanism consistent with sovereignty that would apply some discipline on creditors, or uh, strike that, uh, debtors emerging from a debt restructuring so that they simply cannot go back uh, to their bad old habits. Um, consistent with sovereignty. And how would you do that? Well, I have some ideas. Uh, you could say, for example, that uh, post restructuring, some portion, 5%, 10% of any new non-concessional borrowings have to be mandatorily used to pay down uh, the legacy exposure that you've restructured. That would be a bit of a break. Martin, we all hoped that the market would provide this discipline, but after 12 years of quantitative easing and zero interest rates, uh, the market is eager to lend even in situations where their judgment might be that it is too risky. That may not be true a year or two or three or four from now. That is true. That is true. Um, Anna. So picking up on two things that Lee said, um, I'm afraid our friends would disagree that there is a way consistent with sovereignty yeah. to encumber sovereign um, assets, right? And I do think that what's going on right now is that we have a lot of vulnerable countries that are paying for global public goods. Um, and I do think that there needs to be a way other than debt to meet urgent financial needs um, in vulnerable countries. But as far as something that can be done right now in the debt space, um, it's, it's scandalous that public debt is not publicly known. Um, all bilateral official creditors all cre need at a minimum to publish the general terms and conditions of their debt yesterday, right? Um, borrowers need to make debt contract disclosure a condition to borrowing under domestic legislation because the stakeholders are domestic, are the domestic voters. Um, and I think that that will enable the sort of template approach and the real competition of the sort that Lee referenced earlier. Um, so this is not just, you know, transparency is good for you and take your vitamins. This is really about competition of the good sort and informed borrowing and lending. Thank you. I presume the pro part of the problem, just on, follow on that before we go to Gita, is lots of people don't want to say how much they borrowed and they don't want to tell their citizens how much they borrowed and they don't want to say what they've used the money for and lots of private lenders um, at least want to keep their balance sheets secret uh, even if they'd love to know the balance sheets of all their competitors. So this would require quite a lot of coercive power uh, Martin, that's why we have public policy and public institutions and big, powerful countries and institutions that um, should, um, you know, blank up and do their job. It is scandalous that you have a country whose revenues are so encumbered that IMF Sarir's policies can't even work on that. I'm thinking Chad, right? How come we're just finding out about this now? 
there are institutions that had a job to do, and we as an international community need to make sure it's done. So, so it's a collective action. So I, I understand from this, it's really all the IMF's fault, because <laughs> you have that, allowed... Not me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. I, I can say things like this because I have no responsible position. So, the, so you have allowed countries to play fast and loose uh, and, and creditors in such a way that nobody knows what the situation really is and therefore by definition we don't know how to handle it. Um, so in addition to saying what you think in the fund is the most important um, thing that has to happen, um, Perhaps you could address the role, whether the fund and it's the most important institution, but there are obviously other global international financial institutions, the role of these institutions in, in bringing this transparency into, um, into the system. So what, what's your view of this? What is your role? What is the role of the fund? And what do you think, looking at it from the point of view of the funds, is the most important thing you should be trying to do? Okay, so in the past 45 minutes, we've actually covered a lot of very different questions. <laughs> there is the whole question of why do countries borrow so much and then serially default? There's that whole set of questions. Then there is the question of countries who've now completely exhausted every resource that they have to repay, have come now too late with too little uh, and need restructuring. So I think these are, I think at the IMF, by the way, we, we look at both ends. One of the things that we do, for instance, with our programs, which is not just that we say that, you know, if a country's debt is unsustainable, it has to become sustainable, which means there's restructuring that's involved. But the whole point of being engaged with the authorities, putting in place the structural reforms that will be needed, better fiscal, policies, monetary policies, better macro policies, to put the country on a more sustainable path with respect to uh, you know, its economic prospects, but also hopefully with respect to what it does on the borrowing front. So we're there for that. But I, I think as of now, given where the world is, I think we have the most immediate question, which is what happens when we have more countries that need immediate relief? And you know, on that I would say that uh, we don't have the luxury to solve all the problems on that front. We cannot have a process that takes 18 months to deliver something, some sort of financial assurance. We, things have to move faster. So I guess I agree with what several of you brought up, which is this, is not, this will not be solved with just one or two players. It requires coordinated action from all the different kinds of creditors that we have, including the debtor country in the picture. Everybody knows what the problems are here. Everybody has an incentive to free ride. Um, you always think that the other person is getting a better deal than you are. You know, we don't have the time to go into every one of the things that need to be fixed, but we need to move much faster because there is very much the tendency to gamble for redemption. There's very much a tendency for creditors to hope that they will be gambling for redemption and then nothing gets solved and then everybody is just worse off at the end of it. Okay. Um, this says that we have five seconds left, so I better obey that. I think the, the discussion has brought out to me more than when I came uh, the immense complexity of this in terms of the number of institutions involved, the nature of the, the creditors and debtors involved, um, the, 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 the question about how many countries will be involved at any time, and of course in terms of institutional deficiency. And you ended, Gita, by saying, well, we have to work out a system which will allow us to accelerate the process of handling a crisis. I have to say that given the discussion of the difficulties, um, I, I, I hate to say this, but my reaction was, good luck. <laughs> but I hope we can do better, and you certainly, this discussion has, I must say, really disturbed me even more than I was 
felt before we started on the, um, the, the immense difficulties we're likely to face if the worst scenarios do materialize uh, because we have created a world in this respect which is vastly more complicated than it was 20, 25 years ago. Institutions have evolved, but it's not at all clear that institutions have evolved fast enough to keep up with the problem. May I thank the panel? It's, I think, been a very interesting, if slightly disturbing, discussion to me, and, but I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should go out. I guess there's no exit ramp music. <laughs> 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 <laughs>